Okay, so the revision session is um, split into two sections. So first of all, we have bookkeeping transactions for the first half of the session where we're going to be looking at processing supplier transactions. And then for the second half, we're going to move on to bookkeeping controls in which we're going to have a look at um, journals for payroll. Move this box out of the way. If you do have any questions during the session, if you like to use the chat box. Okay. Okay, so first of all, we're going to have a little look at processing supplier transactions. So this is for the bookkeeping transactions unit. So Remember that it's important that we keep track of the amounts that we owe our credit suppliers. Remember that our credit suppliers are also known as our um, trade payables. Sorry, there's just a couple of people just joining the session now. Okay, so if we receive a purchase invoice from a credit supplier, it increases the trade payables balance. And if we receive a purchase credit note for any returns made by suppliers or any discounts in which we receive from our credit suppliers, it would reduce our trade payables balance. So just remember that trade payables so remember, trade payables are people that we owe or the business owes money to. Sorry, there's still a couple more people just joining us. Okay. Okay, so trade payables, remember it is a liability account. So the business owes the money. So trade payables, anything that increases the liability or the amount owed to our trade payables will be entered onto the credit side of the payables account. So this is for any um, any invoices. So when we purchase goods on credit, they will be entered onto the credit side of the payables account. Anything that decreases the liability to our payables would be debited into the payables account. So this would be things like any payments which are made to our trade payables, any purchase returns or any discounts in which we receive from our credit suppliers. And it's important to make sure that we, ch we check accuracy within our purchase invoices. So make sure that all the cal calculations and all the details are correctly shown. So purchase day books are where we first enter credit transactions. And just remember the purchases day book lists all credit purchases for the period. So the, um, this would be the purchase invoices. They'd all be entered into the purchases day book. The purchase returns day book would show all the returns that we've made to credit suppliers. So it would be a list of all our customer credit notes. And then we have the discounts received day book, which records any prompt payment discounts in which we have received from our credit suppliers. So in this type of task, it's likely that you could get a partially completed um, day book in which you've got to complete. So let's have a little look at a task now. So on the 8th of December, Hilltop Limited ordered goods from Tree Limited who agreed a 10% trade discount and payment terms of 30 days net. 
Your goods were delivered on the 11th of December and the invoice and purchase order are shown below. So as you can see, we've got the purchase invoice. And then we've got the purchase order. So in part A, it says refer to the information above and the purchase order and identify any discrepancies on the invoice by joining each left hand box to the appropriate right hand box. So we've just got someone else joining the session. Okay, so first of all, we have the date. So remember on the information above, So we've got the date on the invoice of 11th of December. And then we're told in the question that the goods were delivered on the 11th of December. So would these, which, which box would we select? Is it correctly shown on the invoice, incorrectly shown or not shown? Yeah, good. Is correctly shown. Okay, so next we've got the customer name. So have a look on our invoice, so what they've put as a customer name and within the question, what the name is. So yeah, good Elizabeth, yeah, it's incorrectly shown, good. So put Hilton. Um, so it's incorrect. So next we have the trade discount. So remember in the question it told us so that they get a 10% trade discount. A 10% trade discount. So on the invoice, does it show that it is correct, incorrect, or not shown? So what would you say about the trade discount? So we can see that they have put it on, on the um invoice. So it is shown. Is it correct or is it incorrect? Yeah, it's actually incorrect. It's incorrect. £3,125 times 10%. It doesn't include £1.25. You can remember to keep yourself on mute during the session and just use the chat box if you can, just to help stop any background noise. Yeah, so the trade discount was incorrectly shown. So what about the VAT rate? So is the VAT rate correct or incorrect on the invoice? So we can see that it is actually correct because it's saying there that the VAT is at 20%. Okay, then we have the quantity of goods delivered. So we have the quantity on the purchase order. 
and then the quantity on the purchase invoice. So is that correctly shown or incorrectly shown? Correctly shown. Yeah, good, thank you. And then last one, the terms of payment. So as you can see on the purchase order, um, it says that the terms of payment agreed are 30 days net. And then on the invoice, normally the payment terms are at the bottom of the invoice, but as you can see, there's no details. So for this one, it isn't shown on the invoice. So purchase invoices and purchase credit notes have been received and partially entered in the purchases day book and purchase returns day book as shown below. Part B, complete the entries in the purchases day book and purchase returns day book by inserting the appropriate figures for each invoice and total the last five columns of the purchases day book and purchase return, returns day book. So when you do this type of question, as well as completing all the columns that you need to, make sure you don't forget to also do the totals row at the bottom as well. Sometimes students miss actually totaling up the individual columns. So first of all, purchases day book, as you can see, we've got the total column, which is our gross column, the VAT, the net, and then our net of the, the, for the purchases, it's been split into two different types. We've got purchases type one and purchases type two. So for Hanoi Limited, what would the total amount be? Yeah, it's 12,000, good. What else would we need to enter on that row? Yeah, the net of 10,000, excellent. One thing just to watch with this type of question as well is if you're given the VAT amount, remember if you do the VAT times six, that will give you the gross amount. So then you can just check in case the net amount might differ. So it may differ if there's two different types of purchases that we need to include within the purchases day book. Okay, so for Milan Limited, we've got a total amount or gross amount of £6,000. So what would the, the VAT amount be? Good. Excellent. And how about the net? 5,000, yeah, so yeah, so we've just got the purchases type two here. And then the last one, Cork Limited. So we've got a gross total of 1,800. So the VAT is 300, good. And what's the net amount? Good. So what is the total of the gross column? I always remember to um, double check your figures when you're totaling up rows and columns. Good, 19,800. Yeah, what about the VAT column? Yeah. The net. Excellent. And then purchases type one. Yeah. And then the last one purchases type two, 6,000, okay. Then we have the purchase returns day book, so similar thing. Okay, so we've got Hanoi Limited, they've made a return 
We're told purchase is type one, £2,000. We've got a VAT amount of £400. So what would the gross amount be? Yeah, good. The gross, 2,400. And what would the net be? 2,000, yeah. Okay, so next we have Cork Limited. So they've got two types of purchases, purchase type one, 100, purchase type two, 600. So what is the net value? Yeah. 700, and then what is the VAT? I can see Elizabeth's already put that in. Yeah, and what's the gross total? 840, good. So what is the total of our gross column? Good. And the total of the VAT column? 540. Total of the net? Yeah, and then the total of our different types of purchases. Good. I think that was it for that one. Yeah. Okay, so we're now going to move over on to bookkeeping controls now. So remember with this one, what we're doing is we're having a look at um, journals for the payroll transactions. So just a quick recap. So remember that a journal it's just a double entry that is posted to the general ledger. And generally journals are used to either, if there's no source document for the transaction, uh, could be um, opening balances as well for a new business so it would re require um, a journal. Yeah, and for payroll as well. Yeah, and also journals are used for correcting errors as well. So just like with any kind of double entry, the same with journals, there must be an equal debit and credit in order for the books to balance. So in, in this type of task, in this payroll task, the main figures that you'll have to identify are the total wages expense to the business. And the wages expense to the business is the cost to the employer for employing its employees. So this would be the gross wage of its employees, the employer's national insurance contributions, and the employer pension contribution, com, uh, contributions. So try to remember the wages expense is the cost to, to the employer for employing its staff. So gross wages plus any other types of employer contributions, main ones being national insurance and pension. Okay, you may also be asked to show the total amount owed to HMRC. Remember the amount owed to HMRC will be a liability to the business because the, the employer must pay this over to HMRC on behalf of its staff. So this would include income tax and any national insurance contributions. This would be employer and employee national insurance contributions. You'll also likely be asked to calculate the net wage. Now the net wage is the gross wage less any other deductions. So gross wage less any income tax, and any other employee contributions, ignore any employer contributions. So gross wages, less than the um, income tax and, and any employee national insurance contributions and any employee pension contributions as well. And then lastly, you may also be asked to calculate any other amounts owed to either pension companies or trade union companies. And again, this is a liability to, to the business because the employer needs to pay this over to them.
So when considering a double entry that will need to be posted for each of these figures, remember that we use the wages control as a way of holding the total expense to the business while we decide how it is broken down between the accounts, like the tax liability and the amount that is likely is actually paid to employees. So remember with, with um, the wages control account, it should equal zero at the end of the period. So at the end of every month, it should carry down as a zero balance. So the double entries that you're likely to need for this type of task is a total wages expense. So remember, this is the cost to the employer for employing its staff. So the wages expense account, we would debit. Don't forget about your dead and click. So remember, wages expense, expense account, which goes onto the dead side of dead and click. And the amount is increasing, or the expense is increasing. So we would debit the account. And we would credit the wages control. So the double entry for the amount owed to HMRC would be a credit to the HMRC account. Remember that the HMRC account is a liability. So liability account falls onto the click side of our dead and click. The liability is increasing. So we would credit the account and then we would debit the wages control. So the wages control will always be involved um, within the double entry, it will either be a debit or a credit. And then the double entry for the net wage. So we would credit the net wage out of the business bank account. So the bank account is an asset. Remember an asset is on the dead side of our dead and click. However, this time it is decreasing because we're paying the money out. So it'll be a credit. And then we would debit the wages control account. And then lastly, we have the amount owed to either the pension provider or a trade union. Again, remember it's a liability because the business needs to pay the money out. So the trade union or pension account liability, again, it goes onto the click side of our dead and click. The liability is increasing, so it would be a credit and then we would need to debit the wages control account. So let's have a little look at a task now. So Dippy Dogs Limited pays its employees by check every month and maintains a wages control account. A summary of last month's payroll transactions is shown below. So we've got details of the gross wage, the employee's national insurance, and the employer's national insurance contribution, income tax and trade union fees. So record the journal entries needed in the general ledger to record the wages and expense, the HMRC liability, the net wages and the trade union liability. So first of all, we need to record the wages expense. So first of all, what, what would be the two accounts that we would need? The wages expense. Not, not bank, Elizabeth, not, not bank yet. So think it's a wages expense. So one of the accounts must be, yes, Elizabeth, that's right. It must be the wages expense account. Good. So what would the second account be? Wages control. Good, Hannah. Good, Elizabeth. Yeah. Remember, the wages control is always involved in as one of the accounts. So if you get a little bit stuck. OK, so let's have a little look at the figures. So what would the amount be?
Yeah, so remember, the wages expense is the cost to the employer. So it is um I'll write it here. So it is the gross wage plus any employer contributions. So it is the gross wage plus the employer's national insurance contribution because that's how much it's costing that employer for having those members of staff. Okay, good. Okay, so wages expense, think about the type of account it is and think about our debit clip. Would that £6,750, would it be a debit or a credit? Think about where it falls, Jessica, under our dead and click. Yeah. So remember, wages expense, it is an expense account. So it goes onto the dead side. It remains on the dead side if it's increasing. If it's decreasing, it would go on the credit side. So therefore, our wages control is a credit. Okay, so next we have um, record the HMRC liability. So to record the liability to HMRC, what would the two accounts be? HMRC, yeah. And the wages control, yeah, good. Okay, let's have a look at the figures. So what would the amount be? Uh, nearly, you're missing one. Yeah, 2,250. So, Let's just get rid of these. So HMRC liability will be the income tax, the employer's national insurance and the employee's national insurance contributions. So these are the amounts that we must pay over to HMRC. Good. So it's 2,250. Okay, so HMRC, would it be a debit or a credit? Remember to think about the type of account. Yeah, good, Elizabeth, yeah. So it is a credit account, so it would be a liability. Uh, I mean, sorry, it's a liability account, so it would be a credit, I said it backwards. Okay, therefore the wages control is a debit. Okay, and then part C, record the net wages paid to employees. So what two accounts would be affected by paying the staff its net wages? Uh, wages control, yeah, because it's all, always wages control will be one of them, yeah. And net wages. Ah, oh, I think someone's put, put it there. Yeah, bank. Yeah, good. OK, 
Okay, and what would the amount be? Remember what net wages is? So it's, yeah, good, Hannah. Yeah, so net wages will be lower than what the gross wages is. Because you, you know when you get your pay slip and you have your gross wage and then it will show a list of all the deductions and then what you finally get in, in your bank is a net wage, the amount after all the deductions from the gross pay. So just in case you are not sure, yeah, so we have the gross wage figure of £6,000. In order to get the net wages, we need to deduct from, from the gross the income tax, the trade union fee and the employee's national insurance contribution. You ignore anything to do with the employer. So we we don't do anything with the employer's national insurance contribution. If we had the employer's pension, we would ignore that as well. Um, yeah, so we said the amount is 4,300. So the easiest account to start with on this is the bank. So we are paying the net wages from the bank. So will it be a debit or a credit in the bank account? Credit, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Elizabeth. It is reducing, so it's a credit. Yeah, reducing the asset, yeah, good. You spotted that yourself, well done. Which means, again, the wages control is a debit. And then lastly, We have the trade union liability. So what would the two accounts be? Wages control again, yeah. And a trade union. And what would the amount be? Yeah, it's just a 200, good. So trade union, would it be a debit or a credit? Think about the type of account. So trade union, so the employer needs to pay this over to the trade union. So it's a liability to the business. Yeah, so it's a credit. The liability is increasing. Good, Jessica. Yeah, so it's credit. And the wages control, therefore, is a debit. Okay, remember, you will be sent the recording of the session if you want to look back at it. If you have any questions, there is um, the email address on, on your screen. Um, trade union, the employer pays. Yeah, it, it depends, Jessica. It depends. Sometimes it can um, you can pay separately as, as an employee. Yeah. Yeah, or oh, it can be elected that the employer pays on, on behalf of the employee. Okay, so thank you very much for all your participation this evening. I will hold on if any of you have any questions.